Hi there, this is Ramey over at MoneyByRamey.com, where our goal is to teach financial freedom to the universe. Our main goal is to help others build up passive and active income sources. Um, and I do that by basically trying to learn how to do it myself and then teach others how to do it uh, the same. Uh, today we're going to be diving into um, the realm of investing, uh, specifically dividend investing. Uh, and I'm going to make a video, um, YouTube video, on the six investing tips for the long run. Uh, I actually just published a, my second book in the simple series, uh, Simple Investing. And this is a little bit of an excerpt from that. I found that a few of these points um, I had listed out in that book and I, and I wanted to expand on them a little bit um, because I thought it was a great uh, thing for our readers and investors everywhere to know about. Um, so without further, further ado, we'll go ahead and we'll just uh, get uh, diving in here. Um, the very first investing tip that I have is to define your investment criteria. Now, what do I mean by that? That means ideally kind of it's a little bit above and beyond the strategy. Um, you first have to develop the strategy and then you have to develop the criteria that you have behind that. Um, so, for instance, when you're first starting on investing, what are you investing in and why are you investing in it? Um, that could be maybe you're looking at growth stocks that are going to get you um, a ton of return but are higher risk. Or you're looking at uh, plays in certain sectors. Whatever it is, you have to have a strategy, then define that criteria around that strategy. Uh, for me, specifically as a div dividend investor, hey, I can say that I want to invest in dividend paying stocks, but if I don't have any criteria to back up what that means, then I'm going to be in trouble when I'm looking at my stock screener. Um, so one of the biggest things, the first thing that we need to do is define the investment criteria. And oftentimes, I love using Finviz uh, stock screener. That's kind of one of my main go-to screening tools. So when I come over here to the screener, this is kind of what a screener looks like. Um, you can see there's just a ton of data points. I mean, we can start manipulating these, um, you know, it changes things around and I've got a ton of stocks and then I can sort by, you know, whatever these are that I'm looking at right now. Um, and it's just, it, it's a lot of data. So uh, for me, kind of what I found helped is that I found some quantifiable uh, elements uh, that I wanted to use to define my criteria. I picked 3% plus dividend yield. Why that specifically? Well, for me, I just feel like anything under that is getting close to the level of it, its equivalent of holding cash. And uh, in cash, my money market can never lose value. That's paying out at 2%. Well, it was. I think it's down to 1.9 um, now. Whereas like a dividend stock, I mean, if I'm getting a dividend that pays 2%, I mean, to me, it's kind of the equivalent, but I could lose value. Um, so, you know, again, it's not totally the same, but that's kind of a little bit of my rationale on why I pick 3 plus percent. Um, five billion plus market cap. This kind of fluctuates a little bit uh, with the main idea that if I'm buying a stock that's a smaller market cap that pays a dividend, um, there's probably more of a likelihood that that stock could run into some issues in a general recession um, or recessionary environment because they might not have the same type of cash flow, buying power, uh, whatever that a, a dividend an aristocrat or a larger market cap at stock. Uh, market cap stock might have. So that's, a, I think, so for me, a, a important criteria that I look at too. So for instance, when I come over here to this stock screen, let's say I sort by market cap, I mean, 4.29 million. I mean, this is a really small company comparative to um, the publicly traded market. This would probably, this would not be a stock. These stocks don't even make my radar screen. Now they might be excellent companies. They could be um, part of your investment strategy or even investment strategy I use that's non-dividend investing, but just, I mean, they're, they're going to be uh, definitely higher risk just because they're smaller, especially from a dividend perspective. Uh, just another one that I have listed on U.S. Stock Exchange, nothing against the rest of the world, and there's always opportunities worldwide, and this could change for me, but I just know the U.S. market. I want to be invested here. Um, you know, if there is a play to get in, in national and um, worldwide markets, then I'm going to uh, have to expand my horizons and really dive into new markets, which I haven't really uh, done uh, a ton yet, um, but it's something that um, primarily I'm looking for stocks that are listed on U.S. Stock Exchange. Difference if I come over here, I'd probably look to filter by country and I would just look at, uh, actually I haven't used a screener in a while, but yeah, you can filter by country over here. And um, and just FYI, I haven't used a screener because I have a custom built 
um, uh, the dividend portfolio that I use, a dividend watch list. And I'm actually looking to build that out into moneybyramy.com. It's a big effort, though, um, and I have to utilize some API tools. Uh, but once I get that built out, I'll let you know. And then, um, yeah, and then hopefully I can let you use it. Uh, next thing is price to earnings ratio less than 20. That just kind of tells me that the amount of money that the stock is making, um, you know, that's somewhat valued. Or uh, it's trading at a decent value per what the current share price is. And so the PE ratio essentially is less than 20 times. And there's a ton of stocks out there that are trading uh, that way. I, you know, I've seen it a lot in um, financial sector. There's a, a lot of different stocks that right now have pretty good PE ratio. So um, that's something that I'm kind of looking at that, again, that I built on my screener. Debt to equity less than two times. <clears throat> Sometimes I use flexibility with this. I actually bought into Caterpillar um, because they were going down on uh, Chinese trade war um headwinds uh but the big thing about that is that their debt to equity is a lot higher but they have to carry a lot more inventory high price inventory that doesn't turn over very quickly relative to you know maybe let's say like a commodity company who turns over inventory like this because it's a disposable product um, so they're going to carry a little bit higher debt uh, which are financing at very low interest rates so i'm not as worried about it in some cases but typically when i'm investing in dividend um, dividend uh, paying companies, I want to see low debt because that means that they don't have as much interest to service and therefore they can pay out dividends uh, even better. Um, and this other one, 15 plus years of consistent dividend payments. I sometimes use flexibility with that, but I try to stay with it as much as I can just because the more consistent the company has been with its dividends, I mean, right now, 15 years, I mean, that means that it's gone through the 08 crisis and was able to, um, you know, still keep up uh, dividend payments. So um, I find that by, you know, let's say I do 3% yield at 5 billion market cap, well, if the P ratio is too high, maybe it's not a great time to invest. Or if the debt is 10 times um, equity, maybe it's not a stock that I want to look at right now. So I try to use, you know, I, I don't use any of these just standalone, like it's not 3% yield, bam, that's a great stock to get into. I kind of use a combination of all of these uh, dividend criteria um, on a daily basis. And I go into more detail in this and in simple investing. Um, I try to really kind of lay out, you know, um, uh, how I do it. And then we go through some real uh, examples. And I have some articles on my site too. So <laughs> um, and here's just a shameless plug for my book, um, Simple Investing. So if you want, you can definitely check this one out. Um, I'm trying to do this new, it's pretty cool. I found this the other day where you can do an embed on your Amazon embed on your um, site. You can preview this book, which you can read the first, I think it was like 30 pages. I was able to scroll through maybe 40. Um, it doesn't get to the nuts and bolts because that you know comes a little bit later. I start off with an introduction, then my story a little bit. Um, but it kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of what, uh, you can expect from that book so definitely um you know check it out and if you and you know if you do end up purchasing it which i hope you will um you know if you could leave me an honest uh, review on amazon.com i definitely would appreciate appreciate that the more reviews i get the higher it ranks in the searches uh, when people are looking for investing or dividends things like that so um second investing tip don't chase a yield now this is primarily um applicable to dividend investors um again when we're coming back up here in the dividend criteria i mean i have my the yield at three plus percent. Um, there's some investors who, and I'll go through a quick little example in a second, who look at yield as the only thing that they're looking for. So if they can find, let's say, like a 15 percent yield, they're happy, um, but they're not taking into account any of the inherent risk behind that, or at least I don't think they're taking it into account. Um, so for instance, here's my portfolio, and I mean, we can live track this. It's actually up a little bit today, and the, that's going to push the yield down. Um, so it's 3.7% yield, whereas the other day it was 3.73%. Um, but I kind of look at an average, a good portfolio that's kind of been built around some dividend aristocrats, solid payers. I mean, I'd expect it to be three, anywhere from three to five percent. And again, that could be fluctuating. You know, give minus a couple uh, percentages, probably to the high side. I mean, the five, maybe it's three to seven percent. Uh, but anything above and beyond that gets a little bit riskier. Um, and I know you, you can read a little bit more about why uh, that is, but as a rule of thumb, the higher the dividend yield, um, the higher the risk. That's typically a good uh, rule of thumb. If a dividend yield is 20%, I mean, there's there's a reason why. And it was interesting. I was looking on Twitter, and somebody said that they were generating $20,000 of dividend income per year. And I was like, hey, that's pretty good. I want to check that out. What's their portfolio value? I was expecting, you know, five, 400, 500, 600,000. Well, they had 150,000. 
and astronomical astronomical 13.3 percent dividend yield. Um, so they were invested in a lot of high risk sectors. Um, you know, according to uh, dividend yield, I, when I clicked through their portfolio, it was a long time ago. I believe it was a lot of shale companies who experienced a huge boom, um, ended up, uh, you know, uh, mining out. And then uh, Saudi Arabia basically tried to drive them out of business. So their share prices have been depressed ever since. Now oil's been kind of lower. So um, they're yielding pretty high, but that's based on some cash flows they're getting uh, previously. So when I saw that, I mean, I'm looking, this is a very, very risky portfolio, in my opinion, um, and one where this individual should look to diversify a little bit. But again, each person has their own strategy. If his is a higher risk dividend investing strategy, more power to him. Uh, wish him wish him the best. Um, the third thing is to establish a position limit. Now, what do I mean by that? So I used to work for a commodity trading company. And uh, I worked in a risk management uh, role, uh, but I dealt a lot with um, uh, the traders. And we had a trading manual that I would read through. And that's where I have a little thank you to Ralph, Ralph, uh, Tim, and Bill. And I don't know if they probably don't read my stuff. Uh, but that's kind of where I got that from. And I wanted to make a little ode to them. But a position limit is uh, a limit that's imposed on the size of anyone's trade. And the uh, goal behind that was to avoid uh, basically unrecoverable losses or losses that would take down the P&L or the company that they call their little businesses profit and loss center. So we always abbreviate it P&L. Um, you know, so for instance, if you're trading, it could be, you know, hey, maybe I only do it in a thousand share increments uh, at any one time, or maybe, you know, a max 5,000 shares traded in a day or a percentage of a uh, base of total assets. I can only make a trade that's, you know, 10% of our total asset base, what, whatever it happens to be. That one would be a little tougher because it fluctuates. Um, but with my, with my portfolio, I actually have two different uh, position limits. I first have, have a, uh, no one position can exceed 15% of the total portfolio value. So if we come out here to the Money by uh, portfolio value or portfolio. And we look at my stocks, we can see that my biggest position is Procter and Gamble, P and G. Um, they've been a, a great performer um, from a share appreciation perspective, um, which has been great. I love to see it. Um, but as that happens, that drives up the percentage of my portfolio. So I haven't been buying into them. I mean, they're a little bit overvalued in my opinion. Um, but if I did buy more into them, then I'd kind of be uh, coming up against that 15%. And the main reason why I do that is that if I um, go above this 15%, let's say I had a stock that was 50% of my portfolio value. Uh, excuse me. If I have a stock that's 50% of my portfolio value um, and they go under or quit paying a dividend, I mean, that's a huge, huge uh, hit to my um, to my total book. Uh, that would, you know, if let's say I had $10,000 in dividends, I quit paying and they were $5,000 worth of my dividends. I mean, that's $5,000 that I lo lose right there. That's a, a pretty big number to hit. But if they're only 15%, uh, that's 1500 I mean, that's that, that's an easier uh, loss to absorb because I have other positions that are making up for it. I expect to see this one actually trending downwards in the sense of limiting you know, maybe to 10% and under and 7% um, to help reduce concentration risk. And I write a little bit more about that here if you want to, um, you know, view what that is. Again, that's kind of from my uh, commodity um, trading days concentration risk. So feel free to click through on that. Um, but that's one of the self-imposed limits. The other one is I typically tr only trade in maximum uh, $5,000 increments. Um, and I just do that just in case if I buy into a company, it's the wrong time to buy into them. And the market goes uh, down on me from a purely, you know, buying in perspective, you know, that helps to hedge my my risk quite a bit. Because um, if I was able to go out there and do, hey, I'm going to do 20000 in this com company, that's going to buy. I mean, that's going to be all my risk at once in that one buy. But if I say I'm going to do four different 5,000 positions spread out, you know, a couple, a month at a time, that helps hedge for some of those risks, um, you know, where, uh, you know, depending where the market goes. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, it stands where you can make more money if you bet it all at once. And some people do that. That's some people's strategy. But mine is to kind of layer and kind of de-risk my portfolio in that perspective. And even further, sometimes it might even look to, like, let's say I wanted to make a $5,000 buy in one stock. I might purchase 3000 on one day and then look to save that other $2,000 for maybe a couple days later or two weeks later, depending on what the market does. I actually did that with J&J. Um, &J. I want to complete a $5,000 buy in on that stock. 
and I did 3,000, the stock went up a little bit, and now they had an $8 billion ruling against them, so now the stock's down, I might actually buy in my 2,000 here, or maybe wait and see if it goes uh, even lower. So that's just a way that I'm, you know, kind of dollar cost averaging, I mean, it's not exactly that, but it is a little bit of averaging down, um, you know, based on, hey, I don't want to make this one big lump, because I know there's still a lot of news out there. So that's definitely a strategy that I kind of use. That kind of falls into this um, in, uh, establishing uh, position limits. Um, the next uh, investing tip that I have for you is know your exit point. Um, for me as a dividend investor, my exit point is when a stock uh, cuts its dividend or quits paying a dividend. Um, that's primarily when I'm going to say I'm going to get out, out of this thing. Now, there is some instances. Um, I used to read uh, I, I, Investor's Business Daily, IBD, quite a bit. Um, and they recommend that stock should be sold when it loses 20% of its principal value. And I like that as a, as a good metric um, because that helps to protect investors um, from being emotionally involved in a stock. It becomes just about numbers. It's, oh, it hit 20%. You know, let's sell it. The idea is that your gains will outpace um, the losses. If you if you do that as a hard um, 20% rule, um, you know, and 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 protect against capital uh, principal loss, which you know, again, it's it's that old adage that if you lose, you know, a thousand. Let's say you start off a thousand, you lose 500. I mean, that's a 50% loss. But in order to make up that um, 1,000 again, you'd have to make another 500 on your 500, which is a 100% gain. So you have to make twice the amount of gains to make up for that principal loss. So I definitely get where that 20% um, uh, number comes in. Uh, but for myself as a dividend investor, I actually like to see when those stocks <laughs> go down so long as no material de deterioration has occurred in the actual stock. And that's something I'm always watching for. I watch the cash flows really closely. I watch for, um, you know, write downs of any type and tangible write downs. One of my stocks that I own, that Kraft Heinz, I didn't own them in the past because I thought their dividend was going to be cut. They cut it. They took all the pain. I got into the stock thinking that, hey, this is a stock that can kind of keep growing up their name. Since I bought into them, they've still been trending downwards. Um, I think there's still some issue. Can they turn it around? That's what people are wondering. I think they can. I think there's a lot of uh, value in a brand name, in the craft name, and they'll figure it out. Um, so that's where I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm rolling with it now. Uh, but if they do cut the dividend or keep taking big, large write downs, it might be something I might, I might just have to say this is a bad buy. But for right now, I'm going to I'm gonna stay with the brand name and also Buffett's still in there. And I, you know, not that I invest because he's in there, but it's, you know, one of, one of the best investors of the world's in there. It kind of makes me feel a little bit better about it. Um, so uh, just know your exit point, whatever that happens to be. If it's a number, um, if it's a particular, whatever's going to trigger that is just something that you want to know. Um, the le next investing tip, <laughs> and everybody might have their own way of doing this, but I recommend um, making sure that you have your own um, spreadsheet or if you're in a trading software that it can track cost and performance for when you sell. Because um, when I first started investing, I didn't necessarily do that. Um, I didn't track what I bought in at cost versus my performance. And I had like little sales attached to that. And so I had to go back and find out original cost on everything and then put my values in there um, as, as far as what I traded on. So I had all these that were, you know, that I had to do the calculation. Um, so that's one thing that I advise uh, to begin with right from the beginning. And you can look on here, here's some things that I track on my own is the initial purchase price. Um, I typically don't sell shares. It's Again, I try to look at each stock that I own as, as ownership in a company. Um, Starbucks, I own Starbucks. Every time I go there for coffee, I get happy because I'm helping to support my stock and so are all those other people that are in that store. So I rarely sell my stocks, but it's important to kind of know both of those. Uh, so initial purchase price is more important for me. The amount of shares purchased, obviously. Um, account where those shares are purchased and I have a few different trading accounts um, so I try to you know make sure I keep track of that uh, total sum of initial purchases so this is where I, I put this in here because this is where the um, for me the math comes into play as far as my aggregate position so my total sum of initial purchase positions uh, say I have 10 of them here's their cost uh, and then I'll take that uh, my total existing value which is all my stocks that begin to have dividends uh, reinvested in them. So there'll be a lot of like fractional shares over here. Um, you know, the share count will go up, the price will do whatever it'll do up or down, and that'll kind of get me my total 
um, value of the portfolio. And then from there, I can calculate the true percentage gain loss, not just from my um, uh, purchase position uh, uh, to current market tracking, but also with all the additional drip um, purchases put in there. Because that's an important thing about dividends. A lot of dividend stocks aren't going to go you know, with these crazy high fluctuations, they're going to be a little bit more steady um, because they're basically more or less established business models that choose to use excess cash flow to pay uh, investors. So it's kind of tough to be like, hey, I'm, you know, making, you know, all this percentage gain off, off of my uh, stocks because you're really not. But where you're really banking is through those dividends that are getting paid to you, that income that you're earning from the stock. So that's kind of why I advocate having that, especially as a, um, a dividend investor. But no matter what, you want to have that. And again, the biggest reason for doing that is just to track performance, but also for tax reporting purposes uh, in case you do sell. And last but not least, investment tip number six is know your investment risk spectrum. So I wrote an article about this, kind of about the strategy that I used. Um, so again, feel free to click through over here. Uh, it's something that I've kind of just, it, I found myself practicing it just normally. Um, you know, it's something that, uh, the long story is short, and I guess I'll just go through this article. Or actually, maybe I won't because it's a little bit longer, but you can definitely check it out. Um, but what I typically do is I invest more in companies that are um, lower risk and I invest less in companies that are higher risk. And the biggest reason why is because lower risk is going to offer less uh, percentage gain over the long term but more safety of principle. That's going to kind of be the core of my portfolio. That makes up a larger percentage of my portfolio. Whereas over here, these higher risk positions, I have s uh, fewer. So there's like, there's smaller uh, entry points. For example, these larger ones might be bought in $5,000 increments, whereas these smaller, riskier investment plays might be bought in, let's say, $1,000 investment points. Well, the goal there is that these higher risk ones, they have much more chance of cutting a dividend or a default or something adversely affecting their stock. But what I'm also hoping is that the markets are over um, emphasizing the negative and that they will be able to turn things around. So the benefit of having these higher risk stocks that are purchased at lower values is that the upside is that much more. Um, so I'm kind of looking at, I bought into uh, some GE, I bought into uh, CenturyLink, a little bit of Newell Brands. Um, I'm trying to think what else we have. I guess we can even look at my portfolio here. Uh, so if we look here, I mean, those Goodyear Tire, I think I'd put up there, Spartan Nash. Uh, yeah, I think that those would kind of be some of my higher risk stocks. You can see Ford as well. They're smaller positions, you know, 970, 795. I mean, I can already tell you that these are down. I've lost money on them. But the goal is that I keep buying more shares through reinvesting um, dividends with the hopes that those uh, stocks are going to eventually figure things out and, and pay off in the end. But if they don't, I mean, my all-in capital on those stocks, I think, is around... You know, three thousand or something or four thousand. So it's not um, the end of the world if they, you know, do end up going under. But if they figure things out, the gains that could happen. I mean, GE used to be a stock that I think traded at, um, you know, seventy dollars at one point. And they're down to eight eight dollars. So if they can ever figure things out and get back to where they need to be, I mean, that's just going to be amazing. Um, I'm looking to see if I can figure that out from Finviz. Looks like I can. I I typically go to Seeking Alpha for charts and. Finviz for the screener, um, so that could be something that I want to look at. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so those are the six investing uh, tips that I have for all of my uh, readers and watchers. Um, if you have any questions on that, feel free to leave me a comment in the video, um, or you can also reach me at uh, Ramey at moneybyramey.com. I always love answering questions, talking to my uh, readers. You can also sign up, if you haven't yet, for our Lint Free and Div Hard uh, newsletter. I look to email all once a week or once every other week. Um, you know, keep you posted on what I either what I'm watching in the market, new developments, um, or so I'll send you a, a summary recap of maybe some articles that I've written. So, um, with that being said, this is a little video summary of the uh, six investing tips for the long run. You can find more 
in um, the my newest book, Simple uh, Investing. So feel free to come over here, check it out. Again, you can preview it. Um, if you if you would, I'd definitely appreciate your patronage. Uh, so feel free to go out there and make that investment and purchase that today. So uh, this is Ramy. It's been great. I'm signing out. Take care. Happy investing.